아, 안녕하세요. 카우스단 설립 5주년 기념 5 곱하기 5 신묘한 나눔의 과학의 특별 간, 강연에 오신 여러분을 모두 환영합니다. 저는 이 특별 그 진, 어, 강연의 진행을 맡은 어, 카우스 과학위원 서울대학교 이현숙입니다. 네, 오늘은 이제 보시다시피 안에 앞에 그 테이블 세팅이 좀 평소와 다른데요. 왜냐하면 이 특별 강연 전에 약 40분 동안 걸쳐서 그 카우스 재단의 설립 5주년 기념 행사가 있었습니다. 그래서 이제 특별한 장소에서 특별한 그 모양으로 기념 강연을 진행하게 되었습니다. 먼저 그 카우스 재단 그 과학위원으로서 그 5주년이 벌써 됐다는 것에 그 감회가 새로운데요. 사실 엊그제 갔거든요. 그 여기 계신 다른 위원들하고 같이 제가 배워가면서 과학위원을 한다는 게 어제 같은 일인데 벌써 5년이 되었는데 그 5년 동안에 정말 이렇게 많은 사랑을 받고 이렇게 많이 발전하고 세계에서 유례 없는 그 과학 강연 그 장르를 만든 것 같아서 정말 뿌듯하고 자랑스럽습니다. 이 카우스단을 그 운영해 주신 분들 어, 그리고 이제 뒤에서 그 수고해 주신 모두, 모든 분들에게 공을 대, 돌려야 될것 같은데 무엇보다도 그 열심히 참석해 주신 그 여러분들한테 그 모든 감사를 드릴 수밖에 없습니다. 오늘은 정말 특별한 날인데요. 저한테도 사실은 특별한 인연이 있는 그 노벨상 수상자가 오늘 5주년을 어, 기념하여 그 강연을 오셨습니다. 그 2001년 노벨 생리의학상 수상자이고 사실은 이제 사이클린이라는 단백질이 어, 세포 주기에서 어떻게 작용한지를 밝혀서 어, 노벨 생리 의학상을 받으신 팀 헌트 경입니다. 영국의 팀 헌트 경과 그분만이 아니라 어, 부인이신 그 탁월한 면역학자이고 전 런던 대학교의 그 학장이셨는데 지금은 일본의 오키나와 리서치 인스티튜트 그러니까 국제 연구소인데요. 거기에 그 어, 연구 어, 학장을 맡고 계시는 메리 콜린스 박사님도 같이 오신 사실은 뜻깊은 날입니다. 저한테 이분들이 그 어떤 의미가 있냐면 사실 팀 헌트 박사님은 제가 이, 어, 1999년에 그 박사 학위를 할때그 케임브리지 대학에서 그 소위 말하는 이그세미너 그러니까 저한테 어, 박사 심사를 하시고 박사를 주신 분이십니다. 제 박사 논문을 최초로 보시고. 어, 그때 그땀 뻘뻘 흘리면서 그 디펜스 했던 생각이 어제 같은데 그때 저한테 주셨던 가르침은 뭐였냐면 이제 논문을 내긴 잘 냈는데 유행을 따르지 말고 정말로 진리를 탐구하라는 말씀이었어요. 그러니까 어떤 때보다도 가장 그 무거운 말씀이었는데 이제 그 말씀을 기대서 왔다고 생각했는데 흔들릴 때마다 힘이 됐었던 것 같습니다. 그뿐만이 아니라 그 이후에 저한테는 어떻게 보면 연구의 후원자이시고 저의 이제 인생의 멘토가 되셨는데요. 그 부부께서 같이 오셨다는 게 저한테는 너무 그 영광입니다. 또한 그 어떻게 보면 3세대라고 할수 있는 저의 한 12명의 제자들이 이 자리에 또 특별 초대를 받아서 와 있습니다. 그래서 이 날이 매우 뜻깊은 날일 수밖에 없습니다. 오늘 진행이 어떻게 될지를 말씀드리겠습니다. 오늘 행사는 팀 헌트 박사님께서 한 35분 정도 강연을 해주시고 그 다음에 질의응답이 있겠습니다. 그런 다음에 그, 그 패널 톡이 메리 콜린스 박사님과 저팀 헌트 세 분이 하는 토론으로 이어질 예정입니다. 그러면 그 오늘 주인공을 소개하겠습니다. 팀 헌트 경이십니다. 팀! <웃음> 아, 아, 제가 사실 이분하고는 영어로 해야 돼요. 잘 못해도. 근데 한국말로 해야 되니 저도 이게 낯설. <웃음> This is a challenge for me. 아, 이거 저한테 도전이거든요. 아, the 어제, translation is yeah. very good, by the way. <웃음> okay, thank you. 아, 정말 2009년 제가 처음 초청한 이후부터 한국에 여러 번 오셨어요. 그러니까 많은 그 중요한 이제 심사를 하셨고 제가 알기로 뭐 호암상 시, 저기 심사 그리고 뭐 서울대학교 자연과학대학에 어, 심사도 하셨고 지금은 또 이제 서울대학교 어, 총장님의 그 자문위원으로도 그 수락을 하셨다고 들었는데 IBS 자문도 하셨고요. 그래서 한국의 과학에 대해서도 많이 아시고 오실 때마다 사실 굉장히 재미있는 
그 장소들을 방문하셔서 한국에 상당히 이제 애정이 깊으신 듯 보이거든요 저한테 그 오늘은 또 재밌는 데를 다녀오셨다고 하는데 팀 헌트 박사님께서 보시는 한국 그리고 한국에 대한 인상 가장 좋은 게 어떤 것인가요? <웃음> What do I like most about Korea? Well, I like the people a lot, and I admire very much their imagination and ingenuity and energy. It's terrific, and I like the food, <laughs> and I like the markets. We were in Namdaemun this morning, and it was just wonderful. Yeah, 저희보다 전통 시장에 더 자주 가시는 분입니다. 아. 이게 5년 전에 팀 헌트 박사님께서는 사실 카오스 재단이 설립되고 그 이렇게 가, 과학 경연을 하겠다, 가, 가, 과학 강연을 이어가겠다라고 이제 발표하는 자리에 그 어, 이제 기자단 하고의 이제 간담회 때도 계셨었거든요. 이후로 5년이 흘렀습니다. 그래서 많은 후원자도 계시고 이 카오스 강연을 즐기시는 분들이 많은데 그래서 오늘 이제 5, 5년에 이제 기념 강연을 하게 되셨는데요. 그 한국의 과학, 그 다음에 대중화, 일반 사람들이 한국 강, 그 한국의 과학 대중화에 대해서 이제 절실하게 느끼고 있는 것을 카오스가 앞장서고 있다고 하는데 오늘 이제 강연을 하시지만 다 경험하시고 난 다음에 혹시라도 이런 과학 음. 강연 나눔 이런 재단이 어떤 거를 좀 해줬으면 좋겠다라는 바람이 혹시 있으실까요? 뭐 재단과 그리고 여기에 참석하신 이제 강연을 즐기시는 분들한테 모두 과학 강연이 이런 방향으로 발전했으면 좋겠다라고 혹시 생각하시는 면이나 부탁하실 <웃음> 것이 있으신지요? Well, I, yeah, there are so many things we don't know and so many things we would like to know. I heard a lecture recently from a young woman who works on smell <웃음> in mice, yeah. you know, and it was a great, great talk, and I realize that great strides are now being made with the combination of AI and the ability to look inside people's brains, the ability to stimulate them. I think finally we're beginning to understand how our minds work, and surely that must be one of the greatest of all scientific goals, and it's going to be so interesting. You know, the, the, how we see things is going to help computers see things and how computers see things help us to understand the brain. I think that's, you know, one of the last really important frontiers. Of course, my main wish is actually that I could be taken back 13.7 billion years to the start of the universe and actually watch the Big Bang and evolution on Earth as it actually happened in a kind of time lapse. movie that that's my that's my dream but we're very far from that. 네, 그걸 우리가 보게 된다면 엄청나게 즐거울 것 같습니다. 사실 더 많은 시간을 뺏을 수는 없고요. 그팀 선생님께서 강연을 하시는 동안 이분이 즐기시는 것만큼 여러분들 즐기시기 바랍니다. 저는 이만 퇴장하겠습니다. 그럼 팀. Thanks. So, let's see if this works. Uh, um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure and an honor to be here tonight. I'm going to tell you the story of my life. And I call it How to Succeed in Science. I'm not sure how successful a scientist I am, but, you know, this, this is one very important measure of success. This is my Nobel Prize. You can see it says here, Tim Hunt. MM1, that means 2001 in Latin figures. So where did I start out? Well, I grew up in Oxford, and my father was a librarian. Here he is studying one of his medieval manuscripts. And um, Oxford, you have to understand, is a university where most of the people are not scientists. and most of my father's friends were historians. So I was very lucky when I went to school that I had a wonderful teacher who was a young German with a PhD in experimental psychology. And Gert made science seem like really good fun 
mysterious, interesting, but in the end, clear. And I think that was a great lesson for, I don't know, a ten-year-old boy to, to get. So then I progressed on, and as a teenager, I loved to read scientific, the stories of successful science, and Marie Curie was one of my first great heroes or heroines, because she was a very determined woman in a male-dominated society. All of her important peers were very learned, ancient gentlemen with long beards, and she was, you know, an incredibly attractive, dynamic young woman. And a very inspiring uh, story, I think. Uh, I also read biographies of the story of penicillin and its discovery. And I went to lectures. I was very lucky. There were lectures held every winter where university teachers would come and, just like today, now, would talk to the general public and anybody could go. And there were three of these things. One was about evolution, one was about the effects of ionizing radiation on biological things, and the third one, which was really what set me in my ways, was uh, this talk on biochemistry. Now, at that time, biochemical pathways, and this is a much more modern version of, 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 of the flow of things in biochemistry, was complicated, and I wondered quite rightly at the time, the, the lecturer talked about where all these funny spirals and things and the compounds and the chemical reactions that went on, but he said nothing about their control. And I wondered how all these things could go, be going on in a cell with no control. And that was a very good thing for a teenager to worry about. And in fact, uh, that was more or less solved while I was a as an undergraduate. So I thought I was good at chemistry and good at biology, so combining the two in biochemistry was the right thing to do. Also the right thing to do was to choose to go to Cambridge University. Because if Oxford, most of the people in, uh, in Oxford are not scientists, most of the people in Cambridge are scientists. And the history of science and discoveries in Cambridge was really quite awe-inspiring and indeed intimidating for a young scientist. I mean, we, quite apart from the great Isaac Newton, who worked out the theory of gravitation, we have Maxwell, who was the first professor of physics there, who worked out about electromagnetism and realized that light was an electromagnetic wave. I mean, this is an extraordinary achievement. By the way, an achievement which for me is virtually impossible to understand. I still do not know what an electromagnetic wave is. I still do not understand how it is that light passes through a bottle of water, but not through the table. I simply don't understand that. It's, it's very complicated. Uh, deep theory. Then we have the discovery of uh, all uh, the, about the atom, the discovery of the electron, the analysis of radioactivity, and the beautiful way that the atom evolves from a kind of a simple planet system to a quantum view where everything is just a probabilistic haze is again something that I, 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 I know about but I don't really understand because I'm not a physicist, I'm a biologist. Um, so these are truly great discoveries of the 20th century. But uh, it was those same physicists, Crick was uh, a physicist, and Watson persuaded him to work on DNA, and between the two of them, and I think one of the great books about scientific discovery is Jim's book called um, The Double Helix, fantastic book, which I've read about three times, because I, I, I knew both of these characters uh, not terribly well, but, you know, sat next to them at dinner, had conversations with them, that kind of, that kind of thing. And uh, it's really true that the discovery of the structure of DNA was one of the defining moments 
of uh, biological research at, at any time. Anyway, so I did okay in the exams, and I couldn't think of anything to do except to become what we called in those days a research student. And I worked with a man who had been my uh, tutor in Cambridge, in Clare College. Um, and he, I said to him, I said, Asher, what shall I work on? And he said, well, why don't you go to the library to find yourself a problem? So I went to the library, and I found a very good problem. And I worked on it for about six months, and it failed completely. So after about six months of research, I had absolutely nothing. So, um, you know, what can you work on? Well, I like what Bruce, another uh, friend and sort of mentor and uh, somebody I admire very much, uh, said, what, I always tell students that you have to work on something that you think is interesting and important. Good advice, that. Try to look for what I call mystery, something that happens in biology, but we have no idea how it actually happens. Very good advice, that. But how do you find a problem? Because there is one other thing which he didn't say, which is that you have to feel that you have the ability to solve that problem within a reasonable length of time. So I was very lucky. I went to my first scientific meeting, which was about maybe 500 meters away from where I worked, just down the road in the chemistry department. And it was a meeting about hemoglobin. And the first talk was by this gentleman here, Henry Borsuk, who gave a very strange talk. This is the title of his talk, Early Development of the Sea Urchin Egg Compared with Erythropoiesis. Erythropoiesis is how red blood cells, how you make blood. So what do sea urchin eggs and red blood cells have in common? Only, really, that Borsuk had worked on both. And uh, he described a problem in red blood cell formation, which was that uh, if we look at the structure of red blood, we see that it has two components. The heme, which carries the oxygen, and the globin, a protein that holds the heme in place. And I, I find it a little bit difficult to see, but in principle, we should be able to see. I think the oxygen is, is that thing there, okay? It's sort of really quite, quite buried in the molecule. But the thing that Borsuk said was that if you do not have iron, and heme contains iron, that's why it's red, um, if you don't make heme, you can't make the globin, because if you made the protein without the heme, it's unstable and precipitates and kills the cells. So there was a coordination between the two. And uh, Vernon Ingram, the man on the right, was a distinguished scientist who'd solved the problem of the chemistry of sickle cell anemia. And he was working on this heme question, and he had a very, very interesting theory, which I thought was fascinating. And the theory went like this. He had evidence that what happened was that the protein is made starting at the beginning, and as it's made, it folds up, and at a certain point, it makes the fold where the heme would bind. And his idea and the evidence he presented seemed to suggest, according to him, that when, so you have to imagine, I'm a ribosome making this protein. So the protein sort of comes out and gets longer and longer. And the thing then folds up. Now, now the heme should come in, but there's no heme. So what happens is the ribosomes stop and wait for the heme to arrive. Amazing, interesting, right? So went back to the lab and told my fellow students about this extraordinary talk and what was the evidence for it. And when we looked in detail at the evidence, we realized that this great scientist had got it wrong. If anything, his experiment suggested quite the reverse. So what we decided to do was to look for ourselves and repeat his experiments in a better way. And when I say we, I was very, very lucky here. 
um, two very important people, Lou Reichart, who is now a distinguished neurobiologist, and Tony Hunter, who is the director of the Salk Institute in uh, Southern California. And Lou had found out, well, he, he was just in Cambridge for a year, and he knew how to make these, these cells, these, these blue cells here, which are still making hemoglobin, so that we had a, a, a model, what we call a model system, making hemoglobin. And, and Tony and I collaborated, really, on our, our PhD. And um, basically, uh, with a little bit of help from uh, the person who was going to be my postdoc advisor, who I met at my second conference in Greece, uh, we studied this problem, and this, this, this little, this is getting very scientific here. You can see this is time running along the bottom, radioactivity in protein, protein synthesis up the side, and you can see if you have heme present, everything goes very smoothly and continuously. If you leave out the heme, it starts off okay and then slows down to a, a, a crawl. If you add back the heme here, you get recovery. So, there's a reversible control of protein synthesis. And um, so we looked at this and we found, in fact, that there was no queuing whatsoever. The ribosomes did not form queues. We also found that if we forced them to queue by other tricks, uh, we could detect the queue. So th that was okay. So actually, we did um, pretty well, Tony and I, for our, our PhD, and I went to work for Irving as a, as, a, as, a, as a postdoc in New York. And there things went badly, I would say, for the most part. That is to say, we worked on this problem and we made essentially no progress. But it's been my experience that sometimes if you try and make progress by going in a straight line, that doesn't work, and the trick is to keep doing something on the side. So one of the things I did on the side was to try and uh, study the genes in polio virus. And that didn't work very well, and I didn't expect it to work very well because red cells, which is what I use to study things, do not get infected by polio virus. So I decided that uh, I should take some polio virus infected cells because they must contain the factors which allow poliovirus protein synthesis, and add them into my cell-free protein synthesis system. So I added in the cytoplasm and, um, and found this amazing thing, which was that it shut off protein synthesis very much in the same way as if you left the heme out. And that was most peculiar because there was plenty of heme there. So what was the poliovirus doing? So it, it took... Uh, Ellie, my collaborator, and I, about six weeks to figure out that the, the, the key substance here was something called double-stranded RNA. It's actually the replicative form of poliovirus. Poliovirus is an RNA virus, and while it replicates, it makes double-stranded RNA. And it turns out that double-stranded RNA in a cell is a kind of alarm signal to the cell. And what we had stumbled on was how cells understand when they have been infected by a virus. I don't think we quite realized that at the time, but that's, that's how it is. And the amazing thing was that tiny amounts, one molecule of, of, of double-stranded RNA could inhibit synthesis by all of the ribosomes, 10 million or so ribosomes in a, in a typical human cell. So that meant that the inhibition of protein synthesis had to be catalytic couldn't be stoichiometric. You couldn't inhibit every single ribosome. With just, there wasn't enough room on the double-stranded RNA. So that, you know, we were very slow, actually, very slow. It took us a long time to figure this out. So I went back to Cambridge and to work with an old friend of mine. He was a fellow graduate student, a couple of years ahead of me. And um, Jim Watson advises, he says, always try to work with people who are cleverer than you are. It's very, very good advice. And uh, Richard and I made a, 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 a great team because Richard was very clever. And the first thing we found out was this, and I, I do apologize for this because this is really, this is, uh, this is very, very scientific. Um, 
we'd been labeling, these are ribosomes, these are the two halves of the ribosome, that's a one ribosome, and then you get these polyribosomes where many ribosomes are on one messenger RNA, and the dotted line is radioactivity in methionine. And what we discovered was there was a huge peak of radioactivity over this small subunit, and that huge peak disappeared when you left the heme out. So that was the step which was inhibited. That was a crucial understanding. And very shortly thereafter, it was discovered what the factor, there was a factor called eukaryotic initiation factor number two, which catalyzed that step. Um, and that was what was inhibited. And that was what allowed us finally to crack the problem open. But uh, that wasn't the end of it, because then the lab burned down. And you might think this was a bad thing to happen, but actually it was a wonderful thing. Why was it a wonderful thing? Because we had to move. And we moved. Our lab was uh, here in the hospital. It was a hematology lab. And right across the road was the famous molecular biology lab where they had 21 Nobel Prizes. And, amazingly, uh, Max Perutz, who was then the director, whoops, there, there is Max, uh, said that we could use his stores and have lunch in his canteen. And his canteen was run by his wife. And uh, we also because we'd burned up all the old data, it was, it was wonderful, actually. We, we were very confused at the time, so getting rid of the old stuff was good. We had a sort of clean break, and we had new surroundings, new labs, new neighbors, new people to talk to, seriously good scientists to contact, because here are uh, sort of my childhood heroes. These people gave us lectures in, in Cambridge. Sydney just died recently. That's Max, the, the director. Fred Sanger, who won two Nobel Prizes, uh, Watson and Crick. And perhaps more importantly, these are some of my own contemporaries. And quite honestly, we did not think, I mean, we clearly were not in the same league as, as these great heroes of molecular biology. But nevertheless, um, you know, quite a lot of us succeeded in winning the Nobel Prize and we would talk to each other and explain what we were doing and you know make suggestions make criticisms and and it was a it was a thoroughly um, vibrant and high-powered uh, environment very inspiring for a, for a young scientist to, to to grow up in and there was a result of this I think more than anything we actually solved the problem and it turned out um, this is another nice science-y slide. This, we're, we're labeling proteins here with uh, radioactive phosphorus labeled ATP. So we're looking at labeled phosphate groups, and I think you can see here this protein here gets incredibly strongly labeled when you add double-stranded RNA and is very lightly labeled when you don't add double-stranded RNA, and this corresponds to one of the subunits of that initiation factor that I mentioned earlier. So uh, it was what had seemed for years, more or less 10 years of mystery, suddenly became absolutely clear. In the absence of heme or the presence of double-stranded RNA, you activated an inhibitor and the inhibitor was a protein kinase which phosphorylated uh, that EIF2. Now here's an example of a protein getting phosphorylated. It's the other way around here. This, this form of the enzyme is totally dead. This form of the protein, which looks for all the world exactly the same, just a slight chemical change here that has very subtle changes in the configuration of the protein. This is active that is completely inactive. In our case, it was the other way around. Phosphorylation killed the protein rather than, and it, in fact, you can never tell. Phosphorylation in our body is, is used tremendously widely. I mean, that um, every time you move a muscle, things are getting phosphorylated and unphosphorylated, and we think by phosphorylation. It's, 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 the, it's, it's sort of the, the way that our cells communicate externally and internally. 
So that was great. Um, and it turned out that actually there are, now we know there are four enzymes which respond to different things. Uh, one of them is uh, an interesting enzyme that detects unfolded proteins and inhibitors of that enzyme uh, are sh showing quite a lot of promise in the treatment of, of neurodegenerative diseases. I don't know that that's going to be a cure for Alzheimer's, but it turns out that inhibiting protein synthesis in, in nerve cells tends to, to, to kill them, and if you can stop that happening, they stay alive longer. So let, let's wait and see. But it's interesting that it takes something like 40 years between the original discovery and the possible clinical application of that discovery. And I think that's quite, quite more the rule. So now I had a problem, which was that I didn't have a problem anymore to work on because I'd solved the problem. And this is a big problem in science. So uh, I remembered Borsuk's talk about the sea urchins. And I, we had a meeting, a scientific meeting, and I invited Tom Humphreys to the meeting because he was the only person in the world who was still working on sea urchin egg protein synthesis. And it turned out that Tom was a keen cyclist, and uh, I lent him my bicycle so that he could go on a cycle ride. So we became friends because of that. And what I didn't know was that he was the director of the embryology course in Woods Hole, and he said to me, Tim, would you like to come next summer to teach in Woods Hole in the summer, and we can do some experiments on sea urchin eggs? And I thought, oh, that's great. So I, I took him up on that and went to work on sea urchin eggs, and here they are. The sea urchin eggs in Woods Hole are a beautiful dark red color, but in those days I only had black and white film in my camera, so uh, this is a black and white photograph. And the way you get eggs from a sea urchin is to give them a little electric shock, 12 volts electric shock. And here is the sea urchin getting her electric shock. And you can do the same with a male and get sperm out. And of course, if you mix eggs with sperm, they get fertilized. And indeed, it was true that when you do that, the unfertilized eggs synthesize very little protein, whereas the fertilized eggs start synthesizing uh, quite a lot of protein, big stimulation. So we worked on that very unsuccessfully for a good long time. And we started looking at them down the microscope, and um, this is what we saw. After fertilization, of course, the eggs start dividing, and they divide amazingly synchronously. And I didn't think very much about that, except a couple of years later, there was a talk by uh, John Gerhardt, a very distinguished scientist from Berkeley, California, uh, who described the work he was doing on the effects of this hormone, progesterone, on frog oocytes. Now, oocytes are the cells inside females that will become eggs. They are the precursors to eggs. And in order to become, to change from being an oocyte into an egg, they have to undergo a process called maturation. And in the case of a frog, it's progesterone that causes this. So let's see if this will work. Add some progesterone to those oocytes and watch what happens. It's not very dramatic. Boom. Although that little thing at the end is actually the first meiotic division. Uh, and John described some very interesting experiments which had been done by a young Japanese a postdoc working in Yale who had discovered that the way this worked, progesterone brought about the activation of an inactive precursor enzyme uh, which catalyzed this maturation process. It catalyzed what we would call in cell cycle terms a G2 to M transition. The cells were poised uh, at the onset of meiosis, and when you added the progesterone, something just tipped them over the, over the brink to uh, form these uh, spindles. Now, so what was this substance called MPF? maturation promoting factor and the, the word factor simply means you have no idea what it is or how it works and the problem was and Gerhardt described this beautifully 
was that when you tried to purify it, it disappeared. It was terribly, terribly unstable. So the best they were able to do was to follow the appearances, and what was clear was it appeared in the two meiotic divisions, meiosis I, meiosis II. At fertilization it disappeared, but it came back when the eggs started to divide, always high when the eggs were actually in the process of, of division. So I thought about this, and I thought, gosh, I wonder if the sea urchins have this stuff too, and we sort of discussed whether they might. And then, uh, but I, I didn't really think any more about it, and then I did an experiment which was really based more on my religious upbringing. My, my parents were both very devout, uh, mem devout Christians, and so I knew a lot about virgin birth, and I read this book, uh, called Artificial Parthenogenesis. That simply means virgin birth and fertilization. And it turned out that sea urchin eggs, you could make them develop without sperm if you added certain chemicals, dilute acids and mild detergent and things like that at the right concentration. So I did an experiment which was really designed to see whether the proteins that were made by these virgin birth eggs were the same as the ones made by proper fertilization. And I got a big surprise, because when I did the experiment, it was very easy. You fertilized the eggs, you added the label, you analyzed the protein. So look at this protein here, labeled cyclin. You see it coming. It's actually here the strongest protein that's made early on, about 25 minutes, I think. And then it suddenly went away, and then it came back again, then it went away again. And it was easy to show that this protein followed the cell division cycle, it rose until the cells reached the climax of division, when I'll show you at the end the chromosomes come apart, and then was degraded, and then it came back again. And if it didn't come back, the cells could not divide. So apparently this was either an enzyme that catalyzed the activation of MPF or MPF itself, but I didn't dare to hope that it was in fact MPF. Here it's a little bit easier to see that there are actually two of these things. These are, these are actually clamocytes. There's protein comes, it goes, it comes, it goes. And this is repeated as long as the cells go on uh, dividing. So uh, what was it and how did it work? Well, there was a big problem, which was that I didn't know anything about the cell cycle and its control. And this is not a good place to be if you're a scientist. You need to know what is known, and you also need to know what is not known. And I was very lucky, again, because an awful lot was not known at that time. So what was known was that the process of actual division of the cells was separated from when the DNA was synthesized by two gaps. And in this uh, series of events or processes in which S phase for synthesis alternates with M phase for mitosis, uh, there are what we would now call checkpoints. And there's one serious decision point here, entry into mitosis, where the activation of MPF is crucial. Then there is one at the end of mitosis where the inactivation of MPF is is what's important, which turns out to be the degradation of cyclin and some other key proteins. Um, and, and finally, there's a, there's a very important uh, control point here at the onset of, of, of DNA synthesis, which I have nothing to say about. So I, I read and I talked to people and I quickly became aware of Lee Hartwell and uh, his beautiful work in yeast which had defined genes that control cell cycle transitions. And he and his colleagues especially focused on this one here called cell division cycle gene number 28 because it controlled a number of different things. So it was almost certainly a regulatory uh, gene. And then Paul Nurse, who followed in Lee's footsteps but used a different kind of yeast, uh, focused on CDC2 because if you killed CDC2, the cells couldn't divide, and they just went on growing longer and longer. But there was another hyperactive form of CDC2 that gave a phenotype like this, where the cells actually were advanced in, 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 in cell division. And so he realized that if a gene, when you kill it, the process can't take place, but you can speed it. It had to be, again, a regulatory, regulatory gene. 
And it turned out that uh, CDC2 and CDC28 appeared to control different cell cycle transitions. CDC28, the onset of S phase, CDC2, uh, the G2 to M transition. And it came as great surprise when these genes were cloned and sequenced that it found out that they were in fact exactly the same thing. And not only that, it looked like they should be a protein kinase, just like the inhibitor of a protein synthesis that I discovered uh, 10 years before. So where did cyclin fit in to all of this? Uh, it wasn't at all clear. And, and so there were a lot of puzzles around this time and fights between the different, you know, my yeast is more important than your yeast and things like that. It was a, it was a confused and troubling time. Meanwhile, we were working away. When I say we, a very happy time of my life because I had two wonderful graduate students, Jeremy and John, and between them they managed to clone and sequence uh, the cyclins from first John C. urchins and then Jeremy from frogs. And once we knew they were in frogs, we knew they would be in humans too. Up to that point, they'd only been in curious sea creatures like clams and, uh, um, and, and sea urchins and starfish. And I knew Paul very well and talked to him frequently, so that was, that, that was good. And finally, we succeeded in uh, cloning this mystery cyclin protein, which didn't look like anything else on Earth. And the story was, of, again, turned out to be terribly simple. Cyclin bound to CDC2, and cyclin activated CDC2, and between the two of them, it made another protein kinase, which in this case catalyzed something much more interesting than inhibiting protein synthesis. It actually catalyzed the entry of cells uh, into mitosis. So what had previously seemed incredibly obscure and difficult to understand, and nobody had ever suggested that a protein could get degraded, uh, because at the time that would have been considered completely impossible. So really the reason that I won a Nobel Prize was because I saw, and I've shown you, I hope, it's a very simple observation, a protein disappeared. I had discovered something that was, at the time, theoretically impossible. If you really want to win a Nobel Prize, the answer is you should do something impossible and believe that, and, and realize that something which was thought to be impossible is actually not impossible. It was sort of silly of people to say it was impossible. So cyclin builds up, turns on CDC2. At a certain point, the cyclin is degraded, the CDC2 turns off, and so the whole thing is very simple. Of course, this is a vast oversimplification, and I could talk for days on the, the, the details of these, how these processes are controlled. But here it is, uh, this, we're looking at chromosomes here, and you just have to imagine that as these things, you know, boing, there the cycling gets degraded. I could show you another movie, it just shows it, go out, it goes out like a light. Absolutely amazing, wonderful, wonderful thing. So, uh, the problem always in science is that you have to follow the road, but you never know where it's going to lead next. Thank you very much. Oh, wait a moment. I need to get my, my, my translator dropped out of my pocket. So I, I can mean, speak in English, but they have my, to yeah, no, 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 I, that's not it, that's not it. Somewhere is it. Where's it going? Where's it going? Where's it going? Oh, it's going to be a little bit of 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 a little bit 오늘 그 강연 들으시고 이제 뭐 질문이 되게 많으실 것 같긴 한데 뭐 과학 질문까지 다 포함해서 uh, You have to come here. Uh, 이게 책상 정리하는 동안에 uh, 시간이 좀 저기 많이 허락되지 않아서 많은 질문은 못, 못 받고 한세개 정도 질문을 받도록 하겠습니다. 뒤쪽이 좀잘안 보이는데 마이크 전달해 시, 주시는 분들이 좀 신경을 써 주셔서 뭐 학생들 좀 위주로 먼저 받도록 하겠지만 
학생 아니신 분들 손 들어주시는 거 대환영입니다. 질문 받겠습니다. 네, 질문이 없으시면 <웃음> 계속 디스커션 question. 해도 될까요? <웃음> 생각하신 동안에 나중에 질문해 주셔도 되니까요. 네, 이렇게 이제 스테이지 밑으로 내려가시고 이제 컨트롤이 좀안 되시는 분인데요. <웃음> 네, 네. 질문 없으십니까? 네, 그러면 아무래도 이제 그 디스커션을 기다리시는 것 같은데. 네, 여기 oh, 질문 yes. 있습니다. 예, <웃음> 네, 그, 그 카메라맨이 좀 고생하시는데 예. That's all right. 제가 여기 서 있는 게더 이상하네요. Yeah. 예. Where's the cameraman? Oh, there he is. 그냥 한국어로 얘기해도 네, 네. 그러면은 저기 통역이 될 겁니다. 예. 그 제가 이제 어, 과학에 좀 관심을 가지게 된 계기가 좀 궁금한데 또 발표 자료를 보니까 마리 퀴리의 어떤 그 생애나 이런 것들의 감명을 받고 좀 과학의 길로 들어섰다고 하신 것 같은데 왜냐하면 부모님은 다 역사가나 뭐 그런 그 직, 직업을 가지셨으니까 그래서 어떤 게 본인을 과학의 길로 이끌었고 그렇게 이끌게 된그 처음 계기가 본인이 이렇게 연구하시면서 얼마나 또 계속 자기를 이제 상기시키게 했는지 그런 것에 좀 궁금합니다. 네. I don't know. I just always was very interested in how things worked. And as I said, I, I, one thing I forgot to say was that one of the things that uh, Gert Sommerhoff, the, my first teacher, taught me was that I was very good at biology. And the reason that I knew that was because I did very well in a biology exam when I was in the middle of the school. I came out very close to the top of the school, even though I had done no work. Or anything, you know. I mean, I just it just biological explanations sort of come very naturally to me. I, I'm pretty stupid, you know. There are lots of things I don't understand at all, but biological explanations seem to kind of make sense. So I was always sort of wondering uh, ab ab about that. And um, I guess at school I had another teacher who was very good, and we used to go out into the fields. and wonder why was this plant growing there and not there and I didn't know quite how to answer that question but I, I think I've always been a rather curious when I was a little boy I was quite curious about things I suppose the thing I was most curious was about old radio sets in those days you know radio sets had valves which glowed and components, you could kind of see how they worked. You could tell a resistor for, from a capacitor. And I, I, I built myself little amplifiers and radio sets. I, I was no good at circuit design. I wasn't smart enough for that. But I, I liked very much the fact you could put these components together and make something that actually worked. And some things were really easy. For example, making a, a microphone. I mean, old telephone handsets used to have a carbon powder in the microphone and um, a little electromagnet in the thing. And you could really easily see how, you know, we built a little, simple little electric motors. And that was good fun because everything was really simple and you could sort of get an intuitive feeling for how it, how it worked. And I think that sort of thing is very important. I was always much better at doing things than reading or writing about them. I was not a, I was not a theoretician. My maths was very weak. Um, but I loved doing stuff and making things, you know? And, and, and it was, so that's sort of what I wanted to do. And I, you know, the, and the fact that you were sort of paid to do this kind of thing and have fun and use gadgets to find out how the world worked, it was great. 네, 그잘 들으셨죠? 그래서 선생님이 감아도 주셨겠지만 제가 지금까지 뵌 Anybody 것은 else? 진짜로 yes. 예, 호기심이 많으십니다. 예, 또, 어, 예, 저도 따라가야 될것 같은데. <웃음> 예, 아까 어, 그 강의 잘 들었고요. 이제 강의 도중에 그 사이클린이라는 것이 그 분화를 갖다가 하는데 굉장히 중요한 요소라고 말씀을 하셨는데 그것이 있음으로 해서 분화가 되고 안 되고 그런데 예, 그 사이클린을 조정함으로써 분화의 속도를 갖다 조절할 수가 있나요? 그걸 빠르게 한다거나 아니면 느리게 한다거나 
그런 것들에 대해서 연구가 진행되고 있는지 아. 그리고 또 실현 가능한지 그게 좀 궁금합니다. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. I think my friend Andrew Murray actually investigated that a little bit. And it, to a first approximation, the answer is yes. If you make it more slowly, certainly things happen more slowly. I'm not so sure that if you speed it up, because other regulatory factors come into play then, because there's another thing that I, uh, th that actually we discovered much later, which keeps things in check. Uh, and that's another whole layer of regulation. So if, for example, DNA synthesis is not yet complete, no matter how much cycling you have, you can't go on. So there is a, there are some, there are, and, and that touches on a, a mystery that I still don't understand. Actually, <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I kind of like uh, Sidney Brenner somewhere says, you know, people think that science is a knowledge-based thing, but actually, it's an ignorance-based thing. And the fun is finding out those areas of ignorance where you could shed some light, and that's much easier said than done, because there are lots of very simple questions like how does light get through glass which doesn't have a simple simple question not a simple answer <laughs> okay and i think there's a lot of science which is like that i mean i people talk about the public understanding of science and how important that is but an awful lot of science you know you you really need to have done a phd and a postdoc in the subject before you even begin to understand what the real problem is so, you know, I was very lucky to be <laughs> in at the ground floor of cell psychology or I would not be standing here tonight. It was simple when I started. Now it's very, very complicated. Good question. 굉장히 그 저기 과학적으로 좋은 질문이었고 근데 이제 분화가 사실은 분열이었다는 거로 알아들으셨죠? 그래서 분화하고 분열은 다른데 이제 세포 분열 때 얘기를 하셨습니다. 사실은 분화는 이제 디프런시에이션이라 해 가지고 다른 거라서요. 저기 저기 분열하지 않네. 그렇지만 굉장히 그 사실은 전공자가 질문할 뭐 그런 질문을 해 주셨습니다. 마지막 질문 하나만 더 받고 그리고 팀 선생님은 좀 짧게 답변해 주시고 예, 디스커션을 시작하도록 하겠습니다. <웃음> 예. 아, 네. well, I know. Interesting. 네, 저기. Yes, that's 마지막 right. 질문자입니다. Ah, 네. 네, 강연 잘 들었습니다. 그 과학자라고 한다면은 이래 그 모르는 사람들이 가지 않은 길을 개척해 나가는 그런 분야를 하신다는 거에 대해서 굉장히 어, 아주 재밌는 일이 될것 같습니다. 근데 제가 궁금한 것은 이제 박사님께서 보시기에는 그 어떠한 그런 그런 사실을 연구하기 위해서 가설을 설정하고 그다음 나아가야 되는데 이러한 가설 설정에 대한 아이디어는 어떻게 하시는지 거기에 대해서 박사님의 노하우를 듣고 싶습니다. <웃음> well, the way you you have to know what's going on to make a guess at how it happens. So I would say that they come from observation originally, observation and thinking. But you're always thinking in an old way of thinking. That's one of the problems, actually. We tend to have prejudices which bias our judgment. And sometimes when we see something new, actually it requires a complete turnover in how we think about things. Uh, so it isn't, it, it, it isn't easy. And I, when I look back at the first paper I wrote about this, I can see that my mind was on something completely different. I mean, I, it... it, it, it it isn't easy. It really isn't easy. But experiment is the thing. I must emphasize that. Experiment, not just thinking. Doing is much more important than thinking. <laughs> 네, 예, 굉장히 좋은 질문들을 많이 해주셨는데 그 아쉽게도 이제 그 청중 질문은 이거로 끝내고 어, 메리 콜린스 박사님을 모셔가지고 그좀 과학자의 인생에 대한 디스커션을 좀 하려고 합니다. 자, 저기 오키나와 리서치 인스티튜트의 <웃음> 그 디노 리서치십니다. 메리 콜린스 박사님을 
아, 박수로 환영해 주십시오. 네. Uh, I think I'll sit here. You're going to sit there? Yeah. Uh, Why no, don't you no, sit I in the middle? You, no. Um, these two should be your seat, and I'll sit here. Okay. <웃음> 네, 어, 여기 잘 나와 있지만 사실은 메리 콜린스 박사님을 우리의 그 강연자로 모셔도 될 만큼 저명한 그 학자십니다. 과학자신데 그러니까 이런 부부가 사실 세상에도 그렇게 많이 흔하지는 않아서 오늘은 좀 특별한 날인 것 같습니다. 그래서 말씀드렸다시피 이거는 저의 이제 손의 평화를 위한 거고요. 그 강연과 관련되기도 하고 강연 바깥의 얘기를 좀 해보도록 하겠습니다. 음, 일단 아, 시작으로 사실은 이제 이런 질문을 어떻게 드려야 될지 모르겠는데 그 2001년에 노벨상을 받으셨지 않습니까? 그 저기 저기 팀 헌트 박사님께서 그게 꽤그 어떻게 보면 과학자 인생으로서는 꽤 이른 나이라고 볼수 있습니다. 어떤 분들은 굉장히 나이가 들으셔서 받으시는데 아주 그 현장에서 굉장히 활발하게 연구를 하실 때 노벨상을 받으셨거든요. 그래서 그게 이제 개인적으로는 굉장히 그 영예였지만 또 한편으로는 그보다 훨씬 더 활동적이셨던 메리 콜린스 박사님한테는 새로운 그 인생의 전기였을 것 같아요. 우리가 상상하지 못하는 다른 부담이나 아니면 일을 할때 있어서 다른 면이 있지 않았을까 해서 제가 사실 첫 번째 질문을 외람되게 메리 콜린스 박사님한테 먼저 드리겠습니다. 그 노벨상을 그 남편이 받으셨을 때 여성 과학자로서 인생에 어떤 변화가 있었는지 아니면은 그 가정 가정 생 가정 생활에서 그일 분담 이런 데서 뭐 균형이 깨져서 그더 많은 부담을 해, 해야 했다던가 아니면 양육에서 그랬다던가 그런 일들이 있었는지요? 네, 좀 궁금했었습니다. 많이. 예. Yeah. Sure. Uh, you know, for the first few years, when you win the Nobel Prize, you travel almost continuously. And Tim loves to travel, so he said yes Still to. Still do. Exactly. <laughs> he said yes to every invitation, basically. Um, and My children were quite small. One was seven years old and one was three years old. And so I was always the bad parent. I was the parent who was at home mm -hmm. uh, saying, you must do your homework, you must do this. You, yeah. And Tim would be the superstar parent mm -hmm. coming home with the <laughs> gifts from around <laughs> the world, basically. So also, I'm quite a bad cook. And Tim is a very good cook. Mm -hmm. And so the children would hate my food, basically. Yeah. They would go, oh, dad doesn't cook like this. You know. So um, I think domestically it made a, I mean, I was so proud, so I'm not resenting it, but it was certainly a few years of, of, of lone parenting, mm. that's for sure. But you know, there is some price you have to pay. Mm. And yeah. I've always told my graduate students who are women, You know, if you marry a scientist, you must marry a good scientist. If you marry a bad scientist, you're going to really resent it. <웃음> <웃음> 예, 그 들으셨지만 그 자녀분들이 굉장히 어리셨어요. 세 살이고 어, 일곱 살이고 그랬으면은 실제로는 아버지가 이 세상에서 가장 유명한 영향력이 큰 노벨상 수상자인 거를 알면서 자라는 거거든요. 굉장히 다를 것 같아요. 그래서 겪었을 뭐 즐거움과 어려움이 다 있었을 것 같은데 그 아버지 어머니로서 과학자로서 또 지켜보실 때 어떠셨나요? 그러니까 성장의 그 이세들이 성장할 때 노벨상이 주는 부담이라는 게 있었을까요? Yeah, I think one story that really amuses me is that um, my older daughter is really not scientific. She is um, she loves words, you know. So one time, Tim is reading a bedtime story to her, and she asked this question, Daddy, why is the ceiling opaque? Why can't you see through the ceiling, right? Now, she's asking that question because she's just learned the word opaque, mm -hmm. and she's very excited. She's probably eight years old, you know? But Tim took this absolutely literally, and he went into this great, um, Think of discovery about quantum mechanics, and he phoned up the Astronomer Royal in the UK, <laughs> and he had to find the answer to this question. And as he just told you in his talk, 
He never found out the answer to this question. But he took it as a scientific question. My daughter had forgotten about it the next day, but <laughs> Tim was worrying about it for a few years after that. So that, that's a funny story, you know? They, they, I think uh, with Tim, you know, sometimes the answer is too much. <laughs> Actually, one, one, I was appalled. It's no wonder that neither of them became scientists, I think, because it turned out that their scientific education was terrible. <laughs> Um, uh, for example, Agnes, the younger one, she was taught the periodic table of the elements. Now, it's very important in the periodic table of the elements to learn them down, because those are the ones that are similar. The noble gases all have complete outer shells. They, they had yeah. to learn them across, which makes no sense at all, unless you were a fairly sophisticated chemist, which no, at the age of seven yeah, yeah. you're not. You know, so that was one thing. And then the other thing was their amazing books that they had to read or learn, I should say, because it turned out these books were simply memory exercises. Mm. They might as well have been learning the kings and queens of England mm. or rather than biology. And I would always try to explain. And then they would always say, oh, dad, shut up. Just tell me what the right answer is. <laughs> <laughs> and again, this is no way to learn science. We were always taught to understand the underlying principles as far as they were known and, and to forget the facts as far as possible because facts are very hard to remember, whereas principles are easy to understand. Once you mm. understand them, you know, they, then you can apply them more widely. So I, 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 and I think both of them had poor... You know, one of the things about my scientific education, I realized in retrospect, almost every single one of my teachers had a PhD mm -hmm. in the subject they were teaching. That's not common in schools. Probably very rare today. Maybe it was commoner just after the war. Yeah, I'm actually very, 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 사실은 그 모든 걸 외우게 하는데 제가 그 TCA 사이클, 그 크랩 사이클을 외우는데 실패했었어요. 왜 ATP가 34개, 36개 나오는지. 근데 도대체 그 외우게 하니까 이해를 못해서 어느 날 너무 화가 나서 뭐, 그러니까 좀 어려운 그 참고서, 교과서들을 다 4개 놓고 비교하면서 공부를 했더니 우리 선생님이 나한테 하나도 안 가르쳐 줬구나. <웃음> 진짜로 이 원리가 있는 건 하나도 안 가르쳐 줬구나라는 걸 깨달아서 그때 그 발견의 기쁨 때문에 아 이런 거라면은 이렇게 논리적이고 이렇게 과학적인 거면은 진짜로 하면 재밌겠다가 이제 어느 날 이제 이 자리에 <웃음> 있게 되는 일을 만들었는데 그 사실은 이제 교육적인 거에서 뭐 그런 부분이 있었던 것 같습니다. 그런 면에서 사실은 제가 오늘 이렇게 굉장히 개인적인 얘기를 하게 되는 게. 제가 보니까 그 노벨상이 가장 좋은 일을 하는 게 뭐냐면 그분들의 그 인생 이야기더라고요. 어떻게 해서 과학을 하고 과학이 어떤 일을 하게 됐고 그 다음에 그 어려웠을 때 그리고 이제 그 좌절과 역경을 어떻게 극복했고 어떻게 즐겼는지의 이야기가 정말로 헤아릴 수 없는 많은 사람들한테 그 영감을 주고 용기도 주고 그런 것 같아요. 그래서 그런 얘기를 이제 이끌어내고 어, 좀 얘기를 저기 듣고자 좀 개인적인 질문들을 하게 됐습니다. 어, 그래서 그런 면에서 말씀드리자면 이제 두분다 제가 아주 존경하는 분들이고 사실 세상에서 모르는 분들이 없는 분들인데 사실 전공이 굉장히 좀 다르세요. 예를 들면 오늘 강연에서 들으셨지만 헌트 박사님은 상당히 굉장히 아주 근원적인 질문을 하고 다른 행정적인 거나 뭐 이런 거는 관계가 없고 호기심을 가지고 원리를 탐구하는 과학을 하셨다고 하면 메리 콜린스 박사님은 면역학에서도 어떻게 하면 이거를 정말로 기술적으로 유용하게 만들고 그 다음에 진짜로 치료에 적용을 할수 있는가 아니면 어떤 사, 어떻게 하면 많은 사람들한테 도움이 되는 그 바이오테크놀로지 이런 생명공학을 어 저기 그 기본을 만들 수 있는가 이런 일을 하셨거든요. 그래서 두 분이 굉장히 그 색깔이 다른 길을 가셨는데 그렇게 그 어떻게 서로 도움을 받으셨을까요? 많이 얘기를 하면서 그러니까 그 가정에서 얼마나 사이언스 얘기를 하시는지 모르겠지만 <웃음> 전혀 다른 길을 가는 게 서로의 커리어에 그러니까 그 과학자의 길에서 그 도움이 됐었는지 아니면 완전히 독립적이었는지 궁금해집니다. Uh. I think we'd do very different
different style of working. So we never work together, no. ever. Um, Tim has been helping me more recently since he retired with some manuscripts, which is very nice. <laughs> I must say he's great at that. But um, no, really just separate. And I don't, I don't know whether that's good or bad. But you do understand good or bad. the kind of yeah. problems, you know. I mean, it, 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 I think it, it, it's, it will probably very hard for a non-scientist married mm. to a scientist to mm. understand that if somebody doesn't come home because they need to stay to finish an experiment, you know, that's... It's not because they hate you or anything. It's <laughs> just because the experiment has to be done, you know. And that, that's uh, that's that's kind of hard. Well, and as you know, science is continual rejection. Yeah. Your yeah. paper is rejected. Your funding is rejected. Your or whatever. experiments don't yeah. work. I mean, most of the time, you do have to understand. Most of the time, you spend troubleshooting. Yeah. Nothing ever works. Yeah. That's Everything true. is always breaking or going wrong or you drop something at the vital moment. I mean, it's a little bit like... Make Actually, I mean, I like cooking very much. It's very similar to that, you know, the, the, the scrambled eggs. You leave things a little bit too long and it's all over. Yeah, 사실은 이제 뭐 제가 그 non-scientist하고 결혼을 했기 때문에 부러워서 말씀을 드리는 건데요. 어 사실은 이제 조금 전에 얘기하신 것처럼 그 실험 과학에 대해서 조금 말씀을 여쭙고 싶어요. 이제 노벨상 수상을 하셨는데 아까 이제 그 저기 오디언스의 질문에서도 그 말하자면 중요한 질문을 실험을 통해서 발견을 한다. 그 이제 실험 과학자의 태도인데요. 그런 측면에서 어 노벨상을 받는 비결 <웃음> 뭐 이거를 그 <웃음> 어떻게 하면 실험을 잘하면 받는지 아니면은 실험을 많이 하다가 어떤 중요한 <웃음> 그 질문을 발견해서 받을 수 있는 기회가 I 있는 건지 그 비결이 뭘까요? Well, I think you just have to follow your nose and you have to be lucky. I, I think the main thing is luck actually because uh, this is in it, it's really important, I think it's impossible to overemphasize the, this concept of discovery. And the key to discoveries is that, you know, you can be paid to go on a voyage of discovery, but you cannot guarantee that the new world will be at the end of the voyage. You may come back empty-handed, you may be wrecked by a terrible storm, all you can do is hope to stumble on something which you don't know is there. I mean, that's the important thing. You don't know what you don't know by definition. So great discoveries are by their very definition the most unexpected findings. For example, at the end of the 19th century, people thought physics was finished. It was mm -hmm. simply a matter of defining certain constants to a yet higher and higher degree, eliminating various sources of error. And then Becquerel discovered that certain things blackened mm. photographic film and radioactivity was discovered and nobody had the faintest clue. Mm. And that opened up the world of the atom and, you know, made mobile phones <laughs> <laughs> possible <laughs> many, many years later, yeah. more than a century later. <laughs> 그 디스커버리라는 게 발견이 그그 그 사람들의 생각과 예측을 벗어나서 일을 하고 이제 실험을 하면서 발견된다는 게 그런데 그럼에도 불구하고 그 얘기하신 거에서 제가 이렇게 자꾸 끌어내려고 하는 게 뭐냐면 그 실험 과학자라는 게그이 청중들한테 어떻게 다가갈 수 있을지 조금만 더 설명해 주셨으면 좋겠습니다. 왜냐하면 이제 저는 이제 과학을 하고 있고 그래서 이제 저도 이제 실험 실험이 어떤 의미를 주는지를 이제 잘 알고 있는데 이그 과학을 즐기시는 분들은요 사실은 상당히 이제 어 과학에 매료돼서 책을 많이 읽고 그 다음에 잘 설명해 주는 강연도 많이 듣고 이제 생각을 많이 하시는데 음. 발견이라는 것이 실험을 통해서 관찰해서 되고 새로운 질문을 거기서 발견한다 그게 이제 학생들한테도 그렇고 관중들한테 그 확실하게 안 다가갈 수도 있을 것 같아서 조금 더그 어 그게 어떤 의미인지 조금 실제적으로 설명을 해 주실 well, 수 있을까요? I, you know, experiments are pretty simple things really. I always think that the good example is to go to a wine tasting. Right? And you have a whole set of bottles of wine. And if you're sensible, you have one bottle of really bad wine 
and you have one bottle of really good wine, and then you have the ones that you can afford in the middle. <laughs> and you try to avoid, you know, I mean, you just compare. And, you know, that's, that's all that there is to it. You're trying to find the best wine for the least money, where you can yeah. actually afford it. I mean, that, that's a very good example of an experiment. Or another experiment, you know, how do you like your eggs boiled? Mm -hmm. You know, so the sensible, if you were really rational about it, you would boil one egg for four minutes, one egg for four minutes, 20 seconds, one egg for four minutes, 40 seconds, so on, right? And then see which one was perfect, and you would have weighed the eggs beforehand to make sure they were all the same and find out the range. How much does a large egg weigh compared to a small egg? You could even be rational and say, how much is the mm -hmm. heat going to get in if the, you know, I mean, that, that it's yeah. ju you're just sort of measuring things and trying to be rational about mm. So the I, world. I, I think that exactly every day you can walk into the lab and do a test. And the most fun days is when it gives you a completely unexpected result. And just on your earlier point of, you know, how to win the Nobel Prize, what I would say in a more um, realistic way is, especially to the young people here, having a life where you can be a scientist until you retire. This is a great life, mm. you know. Don't think, if I don't win the Nobel Prize, I've, I'm done for. I feel that it's a great privilege to be able to be associated with science mm. for your life. You know, it's very free, it's very creative, it's very interesting, it's much, there are things that you'll never understand because you're not clever enough. This is a great world. Mm. Imagine that compared to manufacturing something, you know, or whatever, it's working in a factory, working in a clothes shop. This is great, you know? So I think it's a great job, actually. And I've said to you before in Korea, you know, you can be a great scientist working for Samsung. You yeah. don't have to be a great scientist winning the Nobel Prize. I think science in general is, is a good way of life, you know? Yeah. But I do think that everybody ought to want to win a Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> because, yeah. you know, if you're a scientist, why wouldn't you want to solve it's the true. most important thing you could possibly think of? You know, this is a, this is a perfectly worthy ambition, it seems to me. And, and uh, of course, I, I was very lucky because I grew up with all these role models. Who were, I mean, I really knew, I don't know, how many Nobel Prizes, many, many more people, much more than the average, let's say. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe 20 or something like that. And what was really striking was how different they all were from one another. I mean, some of them were strikingly intelligent. Some of them seemed a bit slow on the uptake. I could think faster mm -hmm. than they could, you know, and it just, and yeah. you could see that there were many, many different styles. And, um, and I think the one thing they had in common, if they, I think they had this in common, was that they liked to get to the bottom of things. They liked things in the end to be, if they were simple. The, the thing is that all our brains are only this big, so we actually can't handle very complicated things, so we really like to, things to be simple. And the great trick is, which takes a lot of experience, is to how to make, in the case of biologists, how to make, how to simplify one's understanding of life. Yeah, 사실 이제 오늘 메리 콜린스 박사님을 모셔, 모신 이유 중에 하나인데 이제 카오스 재단이 이제 강연을 하면서도 사실 그 여성 과학자한테 관심이 많습니다. 그러니까 강연자로서도 관심이 많고 그런데 오늘 사실 세, 세계적으로 성공하신 여성 과학자이시면서 여성이란 말을 붙이기 좀 그렇습니다. 과학자이시면서 동시에 실제로 어, 엄청나게 큰그 인스티튜트 즉뭐 런던 대그 UCL 그리고 오키나와 리서스 인스티튜트를 리드하고 계시는 그 리더시거든요 과학의 리더신데 메리 콜린스 박사님한테 여쭙고 싶어요 저도 사실은 굉장히 그 되게 독특하게 사람들이 보시는 만큼 여성 과학자가 아직도 그렇게 많이 그 전면에서 활동적으로 연구하고 그리고 특히 리더로 가시는 분들이 매우 적습니다. 사실 이제 어느 나라를 보더라도 어왜 그렇다고 생각하시는지 그 다음에 그 메리 콜린스 박사님께서 생각하시는 그 어떻게 하면 그것을 극복할 수 있는지에 대해서 말씀해 주시면 감사하겠습니다. It's a great question. Uh, um, and it's not simple, I don't think. Um, my belief is that science per se is not very prejudiced. It's rather a realistic profession and if you discover something and you publish something good, 
people believe you. So I've never had somebody say to me, I don't believe you because you're a woman. You know, it, it, it's, it's fairly objective, and there are probably worse jobs for prejudice, I think. Um, there are quite a lot of young women scientists everywhere, even in Japan, there are young women scientists. I think women uh, drop out through domestic pressures. Mm -hmm. um, I think women don't take up leadership because they're perhaps busy with family life. Um, I remember the worst time in my life was when I was caring for my children and my parents. That's a really difficult time, you know? So at those points where you might be taking up a bigger job, you may think, oh, I just don't have time, right? So I think there's a certain domestic pressure on that. I think um, that, you know, getting more, more and more young women into science is one trick, I think. Um, they're underrepresented in physics and maths. I don't think they're mm. not very good at physics mm. and maths. I think that perhaps girls in high school think that those subjects are a little dry, no fun. A lot of girls study psychology because it's supposed to be a sort of person science. Um, I think exposing high school girls to, to everything, to all lab environments is a big, uh, big mm. thing to show that it's about people, not just mm. about computer screens mm. and, and you know textbooks. It's really quite a live thing. Um, and I think supporting women with childcare, good childcare, affordable childcare, uh, ways of um, giving them some leeway if they have family issues, you know, those things, I mm. think. So I think it's a mixture between perception of girls themselves, maybe not going into certain subjects, and caring and domestic responsibilities throughout, you know, mid midlife, I think. Those two things, maybe. I was very shocked, I must say, because uh, Mary was a full professor in mm -hmm. the UK, and almost her entire take-home pay went for the childcare mm -hmm. bill. I mean, absolutely amazing. So, the, uh, you know... Yeah, the yeah. <laughs> yeah. 그, mm. 그러면 이제 사실은 다른 각도에서, 그러니까, 어, 저기 과학계 어, 각 분야에서 여성들이 활동하면은 말하자면 인류의 진보와 과학의 발전에 어떤 면이 좋을까요? 혹시 그런 점들이 생각나시는 게 있는지 두 분한테 모두 다그 여쭤보고 싶습니다. Sorry, I didn't. 그러니까 뭐 심리학을 I... 하고 싶다고 그래가지고 뭐한 반에 한 80명은 다 심리학을 간다고 합니다. 그래서 이제 여학생들이 다 심리학과를 다 가고 물리, 수학, 뭐, 뭐 분자생물학 그리고 뭐 물리화학 이런 거에는 이제 잘안 가는 안 가고 있는 현재 상황에서 과학계가 계속해서 여학생들을 많이 들어오려면 이런 노력을 해야 된다고 말씀하셨는데 그러면은 과학의 발전에는 그게 왜 좋은지? Oh. It's critical. I think every scientific field is brain limited, okay? And I think women are as intelligent as men. So mm -hmm. I think if you don't have women in a particular field, you've got half the brains, you know? <laughs> this is kind of obvious to me. Uh, it's a bit like different nationalities. There are whole countries full of people mm -hmm. that aren't doing science. That's very sad because in that country, there's some brains mm -hmm. that would be contributing to the field. So, so I think you, uh, that each field ideally would be you know, uh, attracting everybody who feels they have an aptitude. I think that's that's would would help in general. Tim. Yeah, I don't. I, I mean, I think I, I don't. You know, people are people. I don't really think that gender comes into it. As Mary said, I mean, there are just certain you know domestic and social pressures on women to focus on other aspects of of yeah. life. And if they didn't have, you know, families and children, then they would probably, you know, they would, you know, they'd be full-time scientists or artists or whatever, you know. 예, 그래서 사실은 이제 과학을 꿈꾸는 여학생들이나 어린 학생들이 실제로는 앞으로 닥칠 자신의 뭐 이렇게 어려움 이런 거에 그 겁을 먹고 이제 이, 이 분야를 피하지 않도록 하는 것. 그래서 왜냐하면 여성이든 남성이든 과학을 하고 싶으면 무조건 다 이렇게 격려를 해줘야 되기 때문에 이렇게 이해를 하는 게 맞을 것 같습니다. 저도 사실 그렇게 생각합니다. 그러니까 자신들이 꿈을 펼칠 수 있도록 해주는 것이고 이제 과학에도 그게 그 예외가 아니고요. 
여성 과학자들의 두뇌가 이제 포함이 됐었을 때더 창의적일 수도 있다 그런 말씀을 이해하겠습니다. 실제로 이제 뭐 그런 그 운동들이 많이 불고 있고 그런 것 때문에 이제 더 많은 이제 혁신적 발전이 이루어지고 있는 면도 분명히 있다고 생각해서요. 우리 모두 그런 방향으로 노력해야 될것 같습니다. 실 저기 사실은 이제 시간이 많이 넘었지만 아까 제가 보니까 그 저기 질문을 하시고 싶어 하시는 분들이 있었는데 이제 세계에서 끊어서 못 하신 분도 있고 이후에 이제 디스커션 때문에 다른 질문이 생기셨을 것 같은데 아주 짧게 그두개 정도만 질문을 받아 보도록 하겠습니다. 이 플로어에서 질문이 있을까요? 예, 저기 예, 여학생. Um, hello, um, as a freshman, I've just recently um, dipped my toes into the field of biology and have just been introduced to the subject as a whole. As a student, a female student who wants to pursue a career in science, what would you suggest are methods in order to, I guess, be successful in the future? <laughs> <laughs> the How to win a Nobel Prize? <laughs> 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 well, th th some just. I would give some simple career tips, which is, is moving from one area to another. That can be helpful, you know, learn about different things. That's always good. Tim? Yeah, you just have to keep going. Follow your nose. <laughs> Actually, I always tell, I, you know, I don't know what stage have you reached. We've just finished studying about meiosis and mitosis. Oh gosh, yes, that's very complicated. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, our textbooks are also simple that it's really hard to go in depth into subjects that. Yeah, it's aren't it's it's quite tricky actually. I mean, there's a huge difference between, you know, studying it as a student from books and lectures and uh, talking yeah. to people is terribly, terribly important. By the way, I used to get an awful. I had a friend who was a classics student and had done no science before, and it was really terrific talking with him because it made me try to really sort out my own ideas. And you know, and he would ask dumb yes. questions, which turned out to be very deep and interesting because <laughs> he was a smart fellow. You know, so. Yeah, you, and I think I really, in the end, learned more from my fellow mm. students than I learned from my teachers. The teachers pro provided a kind of stage on which to operate and uh, nudged him uh. in certain directions. But, <laughs> and then, but then, when you go from that to actually being in a lab on your own, it's a huge, huge transition. Yeah. And it it's probably different. took me, I don't know, I suppose at least 10 years, I would say, to even begin to be a decent yeah. scientist because you have to sort of learn that you're really you know you have to learn for yourself how good you are and you learn for yourself by making lots and lots and lots of horrible mistakes <laughs> I think it's true I mean the best student in my undergraduate class went to a lab and quit yeah he couldn't stand it <laughs> he loved to learn things but he couldn't stand the uncertainty of doing experiments whereas I quite like doing experiments so I think you know, making a career. You can make a career around science without doing experiments. So that the, the, the key is go into a lab, do you really enjoy it? If you hate the experiments, become a science journalist, become a patent lawyer, become a pub, you know. Science publisher, a, yeah. Yeah, there's many other things you can do. You have to love the experiments to make a career in science, I think. And the other thing is that it's terribly, terribly important, I think, to work with people you like. Yes, that's true. Um, it's amazing, I, I mean, uh, running a lab is awfully difficult and every so often it happened to me that somebody would kind come into the lab who perhaps not even it wasn't their fault but for some reason the atmosphere got poisoned. <laughs> That's true. And um, I mean it was really funny at the end of my career I had the bizarre experience of having one of the people I most in the world ever liked working with and a person who I really hoped wouldn't come into the lab because I disliked him so much. You know? It was very, very peculiar. And the, the main thing is to sort of be in a happy working environment where people are help. I mean, people don't realize, I think, what a, what a social life science is. I mean, you know, you have friends, you have enemies, you have rivals, there are all kinds of petty jealousies and really interesting, actually. And dealing with all that kind of stuff, as well as, as well as with reality, is part of the part of the satisfaction. And it's very important to have pals because you need somebody to cheer you up when things are going badly. 
and somebody to celebrate with the, when, when, you know, when, when they make a great discovery, you know, you should go out and buy them a drink or have yeah. a party or something. Yeah. You know, 사실 그 교수가 돼서도 늘상 느끼는 건데 그 배우는 거하고 이제 가르치는 것만 하는 줄 알았더니 처음에 교수가 돼가지고 그 동안 하지 않았던 걸 해야 되더라고요. 사람 경영 모든 매니지먼트인데 벤치에서 실험을 잘하는 사람들이 그몇년 동안 그 교육 받은 거는 사실은 매니지먼트하고 상관없는 일이다가 그 사람들 좋아하고 즐기고 이런 거 하다가 어느 날 각양각색의 그 학생들을 데리고 이 사람들을 동기부여하고 매니지하고 뭐 펀딩도 하고 뭐 이런 게 저는 게 굉장히 그 겁나는 일이었던 지금도 여전히 그렇고요 그런 yeah. 일이었는데 그래서 매일이 도전이랍니다. <웃음> 네, 시간이 그좀 가서 죄송한데 이제 더 질문을 못 받겠는데 제가 말하고 끝내는 거는 이거는 좀 저기 너무 아깝고요. 그래서 마지막으로 두 분께 그 오늘 강연과 디스커션 그리고 한국 과학을 보고 그 다음에 이 카오스에 오신 분들을 보고 하시고 싶으신 말씀 있으면은 좀한 말씀씩 짧게 좀 해주셨으면 감사하겠습니다. 메리 먼저 할까요? 네. So thank you very much for this chance to come and talk. And I really enjoy being in Korea. I think people are um, very clear thinking about science is important. Um, I think young people are enthusiastic. I think it's a great country. So I'm always enjoying coming here. Thank you. 네, 감사합니다. <웃음> yeah, it always amuses me, you know, that um, People say, you know, why haven't we won any Nobel <laughs> prizes? But you know, you're a very successful, technologically <laughs> driven <laughs> company, and you have some, ad, you know, I mean, you, w br the UK used to have a great ship shipbuilding industry, but then uh, Hyundai invented a better way of making <laughs> ships, and yes. now the UK doesn't make any ships at all. And our politicians always say, you know, if you're so smart and you have all these Nobel Prize winners, how come you don't have a successful manufacturing? So you're the exact mirror image <laughs> of us, actually. <laughs> really good. It's, it's, yeah. it's, yeah. it's amazing. Um, so th I think that's something to take a, 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 a great pride in um, and something we ought to do something about. But I think really, the, uh, you know, the, there is a, there's a little bit of a problem in Asian societies generally, I don't know whether this is an accurate generalization, but there is a little bit too much respect for the aged and the important. You know, I think if you were a little bit naughtier, a little bit more rebellious, it might help in terms of fundamental science. It probably would not help in terms of building better mobile phones and TV sets. Yeah, it's a very important question. 제가 이 말씀하시니까 뭐 다시 정리하자면 그러니까 끊임없이 이게 사실이다 진리다라고 하는 권위에 끊임없이 도전을 하면서 새로운 길을 개척하는 것 그게 이제 과학이라는 거를 제가 그 학생 때부터 배웠는데요 우리나라 사람들이 머리도 좋고 뭐 세상에서 최고의 기술을 개발시켰기 때문에 자랑스러울 만한 사람들인데 이렇게 머리 좋은 사람들이 왜 노벨상 받느냐고 스스로 너무 위축되지 않았으면 좋겠다는 생각을 해봅니다. Yeah, 그러면서 you have wonderful 네. engineers. 네. Fantastic. 네. Wonderful engineers. 그러면서 어, <웃음> 그러면서도 또 동시에 노벨상도 어느 날꼭 어, 받아야 하는 그런 나, 나라라고 믿습니다. 아, 오늘 정말로 그 제가 <웃음> 몇해 동안 뵈면서도 어, 많이 그 배웠다고 생각했는데 이런 자리에서 또 다른 그 이야기를 들을 수 있어서 저한테 매우 영광이었고요. 하필이면 저의 학생들하고 심지어 저의 식구까지 와 있어가지고 그 오늘 이렇게 망친 거를 어떻게 이제 해야 될지 모르지만 어 저한테 즐거웠던 만큼 여러분 모두에게도 즐거운 시간이 되셨기를 바랍니다. 아 안타깝게도 여기서 이제 끝내야 될것 같습니다. 그리고 또 이제 이그 카우스에서 말씀하신 거는 오늘은 과학 외전이 없답니다. 죄송합니다. 그래서 여기서 그 아쉬운 작별을 해야 될것 같습니다. 오늘 방문해 주시고 그 강연과 토론을 다 해주신 우리 두분 박사님께 큰 박수로 감사의 말씀을 드리고 싶습니다. <웃음> 네, 네, 네.
Oh, very good. 이 마무리 멘트는 이걸 보고 해야 될것 같은데요. 이 아, 카우세단의 모토가 머신, 뭐, 무엇인지 아십니까? 이 뭐의 약자인지 아세요? 초기에는 그 케이오스를 잘못 썼다고 막 이렇게 막그 댓글 되게 많이 왔었어요. 스펠링 틀렸다고 혹시 아시는 분? 네, 그 knowledge 그 다음에 예, 그 과학 지식 나눔입니다. 그러니까 이 무대에서 나누는 과학 지식 나눔인데요. 지난 5년 동안 카오스 재단은 과학 지식을 나눈 일을 앞장서서 해왔고 상당히 많은 그 여러 가지 프로그램들이 여기저기서 탄생하는 데 기여를 했다고 생각하고 있습니다. 어쩌면 은 과학 운동을 해왔다고 볼수 있는데요. 앞으로 5년 후에 그러니까 카오스 재단은 누구나 과학을 향유하고 과학적인 합리적인 세계관을 갖는 사회가 되기를 꿈꾸어 봅니다. 그때는 과학이 어렵고 이해하기 힘들고 그런 것이 아니라 우리 삶에 풍요로움을 가져다 주고 더 자, 나은 사회로 발전하는 그런 데 기여하기를 바라는 것이죠. 그렇게 자리 잡기를 여러분들께서 계속해서 응원해 주시고 지켜봐 주시기를 부탁드립니다. 감사합니다.